David Wilson, General Manager of the Waldorf Astoria, Palm Jumeirah, Next Gen Hotels. David, thank you so much for having us down today. No, it's a pleasure, Mark. Thank you for joining us. I'd love to just kick off with a quick question. What does hospitality mean to you? To me, hospitality means that all-encompassing sense of well-being. I think it, it, it's something that will give you a feeling of welcome, a feeling of warmth, a sense of place, uh, and really just touches the senses, it really appeals to the senses. Okay, amazing. We're on, um, we're on the Palm right now at Waldorf Astoria, but I'd like to take us back. I won't put any years on you yet, <laughs> but take us back to the first role you've ever had in hospitality. What did that look like? What was your first step into this great industry? Well, uh, I guess the very first step was when I was at hotel school and, uh, you know, I wanted to, um, I wanted to work in the kitchen, you know, in my part time. I, mean, I was really fascinated by the kitchen. So I went to the best hotel there was in, in our area and I knocked on the door and they had a very good chef. The chef was very well known in the area, a famous chef. So I knocked on the door and I said, look, I'm studying at the hotel school and I'd like to come and work part time here. And he looked at me and he basically, OK, you know, when can you start? I said, Next Monday. OK, come. And I'm walking out of the door and he said to me, um, by the way, he said, um, what are you studying? And I said, hotel management. He said, I don't need any managers in my kitchen. Forget it. Go home. I said, no, no, I can cook. I promise you I can. He said, no, no, I don't want any managers. I said, look, let me come. I said, I'll come and work for you for free. So I went to that kitchen, said, okay, come. So I went to that kitchen, I started working, and every time he would come around, criticize something, I'd be chopping something, I'd throw it in the bin. He was one of those typical tyrannical, he was yeah. the, maybe an old school Gordon Ramsay. And uh, anyway, he comes around about a month later, five weeks later, and he said, oh, manager. He said, you still here? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm still here. He said, oh, I suppose I, I better pay you. <laughs> So that was the first sort of encounter with that level. And, uh, but I loved it. You know, I always did. And it's passion has been there always. And I think it's passion that, that drives us to do what we do. Because I don't believe without passion, you really can't be in this luxury hotel space. Yeah. No, listen, in co complete agreement. It's, uh, I love that type of story. Unfortunately, I think uh, the new generation going into hotels today probably don't like working for free for a number of weeks in the kitchen. <laughs> Maybe the expectations hard. have it, changed. It, it, yeah, it's hard work. And I would tell anyone going in the same thing. But my first real job was the London Hilton in Park Lane, okay. um, which is great because it's sort of gone for full circle. And here I am back with Hilton. Um, and that was my very first job. And I was really impressed uh, out of hotel school to walk into this magnificent hotel and in those days, that was the international hotel in London. And, and the who's who was staying there. And it, it was really a great experience. There's, a, there's two reasons we really do this podcast. One is, I think people in the industry love hearing from their, their colleagues and maybe, you know, people who work here get to, you know, hear your story and they might not have heard it before. Uh, but there's also, we want to kind of expand to the younger generation to show them the kind of varied career hospitality has to offer. Mm -hmm. And I think many people will always say it's like a passport to the world, right? Because if you study, say, medicine or yeah. law, you can only practice in, in a certain region. Whereas with hospitality, it can take you all over That's the world. Amazing. And, mm -hmm. you know, looking at your, your career today, you've, you've definitely been around. Been all planet. around the globe, yeah. So can you give us like <laughs> just an overview of that and, you know, maybe what it's meant for your, your personal life as well, uh, this experience. Well, it's been fabulous. I think after London, which was a great grounding, I was then in Jakarta, Indonesia, um, with Mandarin Oriental for a while. Then I moved to Hyatt in Australia, then to India, first GM's job. I think I was 34 years old then managing that to Hyatt. Then to Japan, um, Japan to Malaysia, to Singapore, to Bali, where I joined Ritz Carlton. I was many years with Ritz Carlton in Bali, and then went with Ritz Carlton to China, marry, managing the Ritz Carlton and JW there, and then to Dubai. Um, so it's, but it, it's a fantastic journey. I mean, what other industry, if you're not a diplomat, you know, which where would you get that kind of exposure to different places? And what you really gain from it is an amazing exposure to the culture. Of the, of the countries and you feel 
very blessed to be able to work with people in those countries and really get to know them. And you're not going as a tourist, you're actually going under the skin and really working there with them. And I think they're very, very rich experiences. And for the family, I have the two kids and they've grown up on that path as well. And uh, the other thing is now they've got the travel bug. They can't stay in one place for longer than six months without getting on a plane and going somewhere else. So they're, but they're citizens of the world and they've grown up with a multicultural group of friends, uh, which is fabulous, you know. So they have had an exposure to the world that I never had. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny you say that because like I've been blessed enough to be in the same industry and travel all over the world at a fairly young age and genuinely don't see like the borders that maybe other people would see living in certain countries. You literally consider yourself like a citizen of the world. But if you take it back to like the, you mentioned kind of culture there, could you give us a breakdown maybe of take Dubai as one location and you can pick another and just talk to me about the differences that you noticed in the way hospitality is delivered in this country versus the way hospitality is delivered in, in Dubai? Yeah, I would say that, uh, well, we could, Dubai is very similar to Asia in many respects because we have a great uh, variety of labor resources, which we would have maybe in places like Bali, um, but Dubai is more multicultural. Dubai, there's no other hotel I've ever worked in where we have 65 different nationalities in one hotel. It's never happened anywhere else in the world. In, if you work in Japan, you're working with all basically Japanese team okay. and the same in, in Bali. Um, but what you do find is that the focus on hospitality, the way they deliver it is different. For example, if I would say Japan, they have a wonderful ability to execute precision and systems, but maybe they don't have the same warmth of delivery that you would find maybe in Southeast Asia, in, um, in somewhere like uh, Malaysia or Bali or Dubai. Um, so you, you'll find that those cultural differences do affect the, the, the style of service, but not necessarily the level of service because you can expect a high level of service in all areas, but it might be delivered in a slightly different way. And that's on maybe the, the service side, meaning the team. Do you notice a difference in guest expectation in those locations? Oh, definitely. You could say that. I think people, when they go to the, more of the Southeast Asia, they're a lot more relaxed. They're a lot more laid back. When people come to Dubai, it's, it's you know, a different expectation. Okay. And the guests who come to Dubai have extremely high expectations and, uh, uh, and it's up to the hotel to be able to deliver and to meet those. Yeah. So I think it's quite, it, it is quite demanding at times. Right, okay. Mm. Uh, fascinating to, to, to hear the differences. If we pull it back to Waldorf Astoria, you know, I think it's a pretty legendary brand. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think everyone knows the Waldorf in New York as this right. kind of you know, up there with the plaza and other legendary hotels. So can you give us just an, an overview of, of Waldorf as a, as a brand first, and then we can, we can take it back to where we're yeah, sitting today? Yeah, um, the amazing brand. And Conrad Hilton, in his words, when he uh, saw the, the Waldorf story in New York before he bought it, he wrote on a picture, the greatest of them all. And so it was a particular pride okay. for him to acquire the uh, Waldorf story in New York which has an incredible history. And I was fortunate enough to look around the hotel before it closed for renovation. And it's, it's a living museum. It's incredible. Um, and it is now transformed as they, uh, for the international hotels like ours around the globe with amazing hotels, but following the same, I would say, deep-rooted culture. And I think the great thing about a brand like Waldorf Astoria is that it's steeped in history. And I think whichever brand, whether it would be a Chanel, Louis Vuitton, Waldorf Astoria, it goes back to its roots and its tradition of service. And you'll have those iconic areas in the hotel like Peacock Alley that has a story behind them. Some of the famous dishes we serve in the restaurants which have a history to them. So there's a real history and legacy there. And, it, and there's a brand standard, you could say a perception when people say Waldorf Astoria, you already have expectations of the service level that, that will be delivered and the quality that the guest would expect. Yeah. And how do you, I suppose, bring the local nuance of it being placed on a plot of sand yeah. in the middle of the sea in Dubai? Like, 
I you were here. You were here, and then you that's left, right. and then you that came was, back. Yeah, right? I was. You're right. I was here in 2015, which is about a year, just over a year after the opening. Five years. Was away for a couple of years and came back last June. Okay. Um, I think it's more about the the when we came back to what is hospitality rather than the location. It's that sense of well-being again. Could you create that same sense of well-being in a resort hotel? as you could in a city hotel, and how would you do that, and how would you deliver that service? But at the end of the day, we're still talking about the same thing. It's recognizing our guests as individuals. It's delivering personalized service to our guests on a regular basis. It's being able to give them that warm welcome and sense of well-being, whether you be staying in a city hotel or a resort hotel. Okay. And can you give us an overview of the property, just like the basics of rooms, suites, what's here, like if, if you're, I'm telling my family coming over, stay at the Waldorf, what's there? <laughs> well, I think we have one of the best locations in Dubai to start with. And, you know, um, was again, I think Conrad Hilton that said the success of a hotel is location, location, location. Now, our owning company selected this particular location when the Palm was just a, a figment of uh, planning. So they picked this spot and it's perfectly located, beautiful sunsets, beautiful sun all the way through the day. The hotel itself, 317 rooms, which consist as well of 62 um, suites. Uh, we have some beautiful suites. We've got a, an award-winning Italian restaurant with um, an amazing uh, chef who is continually creating uh, too many good dishes that he's always forcing us to try. Uh, we, we try and we, we limit our visits there, but he's amazing. Um, Asian restaurant Lao, an all-day dining restaurant, beautiful poolside. One of the great uh, things that we have here that our guests love is an adult pool. And that is a really nice feature because a lot of guests, some guests love to come with their families and children, but some guests also like a lot of um, peaceful downtime by the pool. So we have that. We've just built a, a beautiful bar on the beach, beach bar, Sunset 55, great banqueting facilities, bar, um, Peacock Alley, of course, famous Peacock Alley in every Waldorf Astoria. Yeah. And that has a history to it. So that, that's there. And um, so we have a great choice of venues for our guests. So what is the split of, of the guests compared to like, is it, is it couples coming for a romantic weekend? Is it families for a week? I saw, I think I saw an Indian wedding downstairs on the yeah, way up. Real mix. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the year, on the time of the year, actually. I think yeah, it's obviously at school holidays, we're popular with families. Okay. Uh, but the rest of the year, couples, I would say a lot of couples, um, British primarily. Um, okay. So we have a lot of British guests, German, um, CIS countries, um, American as well. Okay. See a lot more American guests today than I ever used to. So that, that's, a, and that's a good sign. That's coming to the region in general and you have the benefit of Hilton Honours, I would assume. I think, that, yeah, that is a benefit and they know the Waldorf brand. Yeah which is great. Um, I can't speak for the rest of the, the area, but for us, there's been a, um, a marked increase in American visitors. Interesting. Mm. So you've just hit the, the 10 year anniversary. So that's right. Congratulations. Yes, you know, was there any, how long were you away? Two years, two and a half years. Okay. Would you say there, you know, any highlights over the last kind of 10 years and maybe for the, your first stint and, and now your second stint? Yeah. Um, uh, one of the, the interesting things that, that I, think I always take pleasure in is, is the team. And it's great to see during this time how some of the team members have grown. I mean, there are people here which, have, which joined us in very junior positions have now become managers. And I think that's really rewarding, you know, when you see people grow and develop in a hotel. So, you know, we could talk about all the activities that have happened. And we had a, a lot of marvelous activities that have gone on through the time and celebrations, special events uh, during the hotel. But I always really take pride in the fact that we've been able to develop those uh, young joiners to where they are today. But that really changes people's lives. Yeah. No, listen, for sure. And I think if maybe there's, there's also a lot of people who listen in who are leaders, would there be any kind of advice you'd give on how you can structure, even like myself with our team, I think one thing you struggle with is, yeah, I'm still relatively young, but I'm not, you know, 22 coming in from university now. And I think there, like when I started first in hotels, I think I did the kitchen for 12 months and I think mm. I was allowed 
basically go from cleaning plates to peeling potatoes. That was pretty much my transition. Yeah. Yeah. You ask someone who comes into the workforce now to do that for 12 months. You know, yeah, that's uh, hard. You don't, Everybody, they today, value yeah. themselves more than we did. That's right. They have an expectation yeah. that you know, after six months, they could be a manager or... GM, they want your role. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how do you manage that nowadays versus... Uh, uh, yeah, that's a challenge, but you really need to have a good communication with the team. Uh, we really need to get them to understand the importance of each level of the job that they're doing. That, you know, I was, as we were going back to the old traditional way, as people move through the ranks, they felt they really earned that promotion. Now, if you really earn that next level uh, up, you respect it and you feel I've, I've earned it, I've worked for it, and I've gained that knowledge um, as opposed to someone just flying through the ranks and going up to a management position very quickly. But we also have to, uh, you know, what I always tell them is I, I'd say, look, um, knowledge is like money in the bank. This is something you'll never lose. Whatever, whatever time you spent learning, whatever knowledge you can put in the bank, every, the, if you work with the best people in the industry and you can really extract that experience from them and that learning from them, you will never lose it. Now, whatever happens in your life, that will be your your savings. You'll be able to work with that. You'll be able to grow your career. It'll give you security, stability, and a career uh, to follow. So take your time and learn and ask questions and work with the best people you can. You know, people seems to be a big driver behind you being able to deliver great service. I know in like Europe, in the States, we've, we've definitely struggled with getting labor in to hospitality. Mm -hmm. is, is that the same over here? Have you not struggled with it? No, it's, it's not good? really a struggle. Okay. It's not a struggle to get people. I think it's, a, it's more of a struggle to, of course, get the right people. Yeah. That's important. And then retain them. Because you have to be able to create a work environment where people feel that they belong to, to the organization and that they don't want to leave every six months. And, we do that by, you've got to make people feel part of the success. And I think that's about communication. It, if somebody's just doing a job, that's just a job that they feel they could leave. But if they feel that they're playing a strong part in the success of the business and that they're important to what you do, you have more chance to retain them. Yeah. If you were to give advice to someone starting their first role, let's say they're going to start here tomorrow, and you were giving them a couple of words of advice to, to succeed, what would, what would that be? <laughs> I'm a bit old school, so I'll say, come earlier than everybody else, leave later than everybody else, um, work with the best people you can, study, and now, today, there's so many different sources of knowledge. You've got YouTube, you've got Instagram, be aware of what's around you, don't wait to be spoon-fed, go out and, and, and learn, um, and really do the best in every job you can as you work through through the ranks. Okay, amazing. Thank you for that. <laughs> Pivoting back to, uh, like I said, I came up through the lobby today, which is beautiful, by the way, and I saw an amazing Indian wedding. Everyone looked like they were having a, a lot of fun. Um, it, Dubai is an interesting place, and the palm for, for weddings, has that been something that you've marketed? Is it something that's naturally happened? Like, how do you see the kind of the trends of the wedding industry? Yeah, um, definitely a bit of combination, but we, we do market it. It's a strong part of our business. And we also are blessed with a great location because our lawn area is one of the few places in Dubai where you can actually have a wedding right on the beach or going onto the beach. So, um, you know, it, it's given us an advantage. We had uh, brides arriving by helicopter. We've had brides arriving by yacht. <laughs> we've had uh, weddings from uh, all around the world. People have come here for their wedding celebrations. And I think the trend, I would say now, is much more towards personalized bespoke weddings. It's never one size fits all. Um, people are a lot more, I would say, creative in their needs and their desires of what they want for their weddings. We've had vegan weddings. We've had... Uh, all types of uh, different requests for weddings, different gourmet experiences, small weddings, large weddings. Uh, uh, so I think that every bride, every couple today want to create a very distinctive style of yeah. wedding. And it's our responsibility and our role to be able to supply that by, uh, by making a tailor-made experience for them. 
And is it usually people who are living in the region doing it or is it destinations where they're usually fly? No, a bit of both. I mean, a lot of destinations. We had people coming from the US. We've had people, from, as you said, from India coming over. We've had people from uh, Africa. We've had couples from the UK. Actually, you know, with our location being so close to Europe and so close to Asia, it's a great meeting point. So you have maybe a, a, a groom from the UK, a bride from Asia or vice versa. Where's the best place to meet up? Yeah. Definitely yeah. Okay. Dubai. Uh, the property is obviously quite large, but and you mentioned like an adult pool to keep, say, couples away from from screaming kids sometimes yeah, if, they're for, for, if they're for a romantic weekend. But how do you do that when a wedding is in a property? What's the best way to manage that so it doesn't feel like other guests think that the wedding group own the hotel? Yeah, challenge. We, 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 we have two basic ways to do that. One is if it's, let's say, on rare occasions, a complete buyout and someone wants the whole hotel. But if not, then we restrict the amount of rooms that we would okay. allow that wedding to have. And we have extremely strict regulations on uh, noise control, we uh, determine which equipment could be used and where and volume levels and uh, we'd manage the process so that it wouldn't be intrusive but uh, it needs to be carefully managed because it always can be a challenge yeah do you see any other trends coming to hit dubai that you've noticed how long have you been in dubai now well now eight years okay. so it was sort of one of those things i would think i would be here for two years and we're here uh, like a lot of people you speak to in dubai is common you say how long have, oh we come for two years we're here eight years i mean dubai is one of the best places on the planet to live and i think we're all lucky to be here um trends i see definitely in the food side i you know one of the great trends i see now is dubai used to be always importing brands from overseas. A restaurant from UK comes here. One of the great things I see now is that homegrown restaurants from Dubai going overseas. And we have some amazing uh, uh, culinary talent in, in Dubai that wasn't there before. We have chefs like Orfali uh, doing yeah, incredible yeah. things. Um, and we've got Maine opened in London and uh, you know so I think that there's really a focus on culinary yeah. development and experiences beyond the the big name restaurants and I think that's that's a very positive thing um, just on that piece is the the chef and kitchen is still very close to your heart it is yeah, yeah. so we had Tom Arnell on who's the owner of eat exo has got the guild and yeah. the common search and yeah. stuff and we're having a conversation around uh, hotels you know, traditionally have given like the big names an opportunity like uh, Gordon Ramsay or Heston or all of those. And you understand mm. why they do it. But I think sometimes maybe they fly in for the photograph, they take yeah. the photograph, they take their money and they leave. Yeah. And should hotels be given homegrown talent because it's such a beautiful, you said, location, location, yeah. location. Yeah. Should maybe the hotels be giving the, the homegrown talent more of an opportunity to oh, partner rather yeah. than just bringing no oh, boo? And absolutely, I think definitely. I think, unfortunately, and there's a good example. I mean, Tom and Serge and Tom with his restaurants and um, he's got the like Hawker Boy, which yeah. is amazing. And the Guild, the Guild is the incredible. incredible. I restaurant. think it's the best restaurant uh, that's opened in Dubai. You know, so they've done so many great things and I absolutely agree. And, and Unfortunately, there's still that brand image, you know, where people are buying a brand sometimes rather than an experience. Because okay. if you want a food experience, go to Orfali. You know, if you want a brand experience, maybe you go to Nobu. But it's different. And uh, the homegrown restaurants, I think hotels definitely should be showcasing homegrown talent. But it, we also have to persuade the guests that this is really the place you should go to. Don't just head for the big names head for something, you know, because yeah. when we go to another city, if we go to London, we go to Paris, we go to Rome, we try to source those independent small local restaurants. Don't you? I mean, you, you're not going to go to all necessarily the, the big name places, but you're going to do a bit of research and you'll find the hidden gems. But in Dubai, it's not really at that stage yet where people are doing this. Yeah, because if you look at, you know, the neighbor, the Royal Atlantis and you know, love the team up there, but it's, it's Heston and Gordon and now Carbone. Like, do you mm -hmm. think guests obviously see that and it's like they like the glitz and the glam, but maybe would they like one of the 11 restaurants to be an Orfali? You know? I would love to see that. Uh, yeah, you know, I think it'd be amazing. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Listen, let's see. <laughs> let's see what happens. 
Um, love to move into kind of your your leadership philosophy mm -hmm. um, because I think most brands are usually a reflection of the personality at the top because that's how the team look up to you and speak to you and interact with you every day and then they go and make their guests lives hopefully improved for the stay so you know how do you how do you lead from the front what's your oh uh, <laughs> has it changed over the years as well uh, well that's a good question I, I uh, after the, all this time i suppose it's not something you really think about too much because it becomes almost a natural way of what you do um, for me there's really a focus on the guest experience and i think underneath that guest experience what creates guest experience uh, so my philosophy is based on culture and building a culture in the hotel and one of the first things i would do in a hotel at a property like this is to build that foundation of the culture because i believe the culture is the platform from which everything is delivered and uh, creating a service experience for the guest has to be uh, provided by that by, by that base. So I'm a great believer in focusing on the product, product being service, quality, guest experience, and that that will drive the bottom line rather than, let's say, focusing on the bottom line and hoping everything else will work out. So um, I think it needs attention to detail. It needs really good communication on a constant basis. I think as a leader, you need to be fully engaged with your business. It has to be, you have to be passionate and that passion needs to be there, should be there for what you do. And we need, really need to come back to something I said earlier is making everyone in the property feel that they're part of the success and what is success and being able to communicate to them what does success look like and what can you do to influence that. And when you walk away from the hotel at the end of the day, that our team members can say, I made a difference. I did something. I'm not just working in a hotel, but um, you know, I'm really creating something. And it, it's like going back to that old story of John F. Kennedy when he walked around the Space Center in NASA and he found the, the guy sweeping the floor and he said, what's your role here? And he said, my role is to put a man on the moon. I mean, that's fabulous. Isn't Amazing. It? So how do you get that kind of mm. commitment that your team are fully committed to what you yeah. do? and the journey that you want to go on. So you have to be able to communicate that. And you have to be, most importantly, you have to get the right people, the right team with you, getting the right people in the right job who can help you deliver that. The team is so, so, so important. Have you any small micro examples of how you implement that on a day-to-day -day basis so the guy sweeping the floor says that back to, to JFK? Yeah, a lot of it is, let's say, for example, uh, you know, we, 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 we meet every day, as a lot of hotels do, but we go into real detail about the guest experience. We talk about it a lot. And, you know, I always, I love to have, I have on my desk these really great first class cards who look beautiful. If I hear if somebody's done an exceptional job and they're gonna, I'll write a personal card for them, I'll thank them for it. We'll recognize them if they're continually doing this, of course, with awards and everything, but really just so many people underestimate the power of saying thank you. Yeah and you're doing a great job. That means a lot. I mean, I, 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 how many times when we started off in this hotel business did the GM ever come and tell, tell you, hey, you're doing a great job? Yeah. You know, I would have been super impressed with yeah. that. Yeah, because I think they look up to you more than you might think yourself. You yeah, you don't words think about have a bigger it, impact. It, it does have a yeah. big impact. Uh, we have great quality management processes in place. Uh, which we work very hard on. Uh, we work hard on systems and all the backup to that. So culture supported by systems, developing great people and rewarding excellent performance. Yeah. I think it's like it's a... quite simple really, isn't it? It, it, it is harder to implement, <laughs> but it is. Um, I had Bill Walsh on the podcast a few weeks ago. I don't know if you know Bill, he was the CMO at Jamira and then CEO of Viceroy. Mm. And he always like talks about the difference between service and hospitality. And I had like, my favorite story in hospitality is, um, there was a, a young girl who'd left her teddy bear at a hotel and the parents rang the hotel to see if they had the teddy bear. And our service would have been like, yes, we have the teddy bear, send it in the post and send it back. Mm -hmm. But they took the teddy bear on a photo shoot around the resort, but yeah. the teddy bear went to the spa and the teddy bear had a cocktail and the teddy bear right. had dinner. Yeah. They put it in a photo album and they sent the photo album with the teddy back to the young girl. Yeah. And like that's hospitality. It you is. Know. It's the small things that, that yeah. count. And uh, we were just 
only just talking about this this morning in our morning uh, meeting because it's not always about the expense. And I look, you know, when you talk about hotels, brand, luxury, it's not about the logo on the door. The logo, I could put a logo on any door. You could build a hotel for any expense, the bricks, the mortar, the glass, the marble. It's, that's not about what, that's not what people remember. They remember the experience that the team give them. They remember the service that they got and the culture and the service build the brand, support the brand. Um, and, you know, we had, um, you know, years back, we had a Kobe Bryant uh, was, was staying with us and he loves these uh, C's candy. There's a particular C's candy that he loved. And at that time, we couldn't get that particular candy. So we had someone fly in with those candies. And, you know, we, he arrived and we had lots of nice photos, personalized the room, sweet, all of that. But the one thing that he loved more than anything else were those candies. Yeah. And he had his big, you know, big team with him. He said, you guys keep off these candies, these are mine. <laughs> So it was something that probably cost $20, but it was just to really touch the heart. And if you can touch the heart of the guest, you can create that emotion, then you've really done something. It's so true. I, like even now, I'll stay in some hotels and like I'm big into my fitness and I've got this big kind of endurance race coming up and like they'll nicely leave a dessert with a bottle of wine in my room. Mm. But it's like the worst thing you could leave me. <laughs> like if you left like electrolytes and a protein shake, that would actually that be, would be personal better. to me. That would be better. I mean, so yeah, exactly. If you go on a business trip and you're there yeah. for two nights and you're on your own and somebody gives you a bottle of wine, you think, well, okay, what am I going to do with this? Oh, it's not yeah. really, that's not really very useful, is it? Yeah. So well, it's not, I'm in complete agreement. One thing I'm super interested in, you've worked with like big brands. How do you, and I please don't take this in any, um, in any bad way, but some people might say, well, like Hilton and Marriott, it's hard to give, it's a bit soulless, it's hard to give the personalized, like the boutiques or like the luxury boutiques where, how do you implement that type of service with such a big, massive scaled logo? I think that, that it was very much, I'll go back to the Ritz-Carlton days, you know, when I joined Ritz-Carlton, it was at that time only 37 hotels and it was run pretty much as an independent uh, company and it had a lot of again i'll say culture and that culture had remained with the brand um, as it grew it, it did change i would say as it became part of marriott it did lose uh, a lot of that culture that identity um, hotels like waldorf astoria we get a lot of freedom in the brand. I mean, I, I as a, for me as a general manager, I don't have a whole manual of brand standards. Okay. We do have brand standards. We have certain compliance. Of course we do. But I'm free to create the guest experience I want to create. I'm given a lot of freedom and a lot of leeway to do that. I'm not told to do this and this. As you move down and out of luxury, I think of luxury brands, you move into the more uh, mainstream brands, I would say there are more probably clearly defined uh, standards, brand standards. And that, for a certain degree, is maybe because some of these hotels are franchised as well. So as you move down into five-star, four-star hotels, the, the brand standards are very specific and um, probably more strictly adhered to. Because if you franchise an operation, you want the, the operator owner to maintain consistency. But luxury isn't about consistency. We have consistent standards, yes, but we also have to create experiences on top of that. So of course, the, you know, the brand standards are ESOP amenities in the room are there, uh, our frette linen is there, all of these things, but these are good things, this is luxury. But on top of that, we're able, we have a lot of freedom to say, let's do this today, let's do that, let's do this, uh, let's create some new experience for the guest. And, uh, so this is, uh, I think, how you've got to be able to, uh, let's say, be more of an entrepreneur in the business. Yeah. Uh, you're echoing the words of Bill. He came into a group and, for example, um, he said he, a barista should be able to see that this guest has come for the last three weeks, three mm. times a week, mm. and maybe on the seventh time go, coffee's on us today. No. Love that you're, mm. But they couldn't do it because finance wouldn't let them <laughs> comp a coffee. Right. He's like, that's the level of freedom and like entrepreneurialism that 
the team need to be given to make a little special moment. It, and that touches on an important point, because to be able to deliver that level of service, we need empowerment, which is something we really endorse here. And we tell our team, you are free to do what you want. You find out there's a, a special occasion and the guests staying with us, you're free. You want to do chocolates, you want to put flowers, you want to put cake, whatever. No one's going to stop you. You do what you think you need to do. I, I Coming back to this, and I meet with our housekeeping team, and I asked the whole housekeeping attendants. We're all lined up in the morning, and I said, what's your, what's your job here? They're all looking very nervous and nobody wants to speak. And, and once I'm saying, well, cleaning the rooms, I said, well, yeah. I said, yeah, absolutely. Cleaning the rooms is your job, but what's your purpose? Your purpose is to create guest memories, special memories and experiences for our guests. That's your purpose. Your job is to clean the room, but that's basic. When somebody stays in a Waldorf Astoria, they expect a perfectly clean room. It doesn't create any wow experience for them. So you have to go above and beyond. Yep. Any hotel can give you a clean room. Doesn't need to be a Waldorf Astoria. But your job is to go beyond that. And the same for the doorman. You say, doorman, what's your job? Open the door. No, you're, you're, but your purpose is to give a warm welcome to the guests. What's the difference between your function, which is your yep. job, and your purpose? Yep. If you really understand that, and you can communicate that to the team, your function is this, but your purpose is that. Yeah. Then you and you're empowered to reach that purpose. Then, then you you've got something. So so important because what happens every day in the corridors? Guests are walking by the housekeepers the whole time. Hmm. And I always notice the difference in hotels with the housekeepers who smile at you and say how are you versus mm -hmm. the ones who head down, head and down and hide away. <laughs> yeah. You know, because they're so they're still part of the guest experience. Absolutely. Um, Really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah. I'd probably go on for hours if we were left alone. I'd like to move into two final questions, which is really just a little bit about the future. So first, start with with this property. Any anything planned, exciting coming up? Is yeah, it, a lot of things we've got in the pipeline now. We're embarking on a, a rooms renovation and uh, and looking at some of the property renovation now. Uh, we're redoing again. I mentioned our our uh, Sunset Fifty Five new venue. We're completely we put it in as a bit of a pop-up and it was so successful, really worked well. So over the summer, we were completely rebuilding that into a great uh, sunset bar. Um, we've got a new food and beverage outlet we're working on as well, which is going to be like, uh, I would say, a gastro bar uh, featuring heavily influenced British style, British cuisine, maybe some Irish uh, yeah, as well. I was going to say. <laughs> some Guinness, we'll put it. Uh, so that's, that's in, the, in, the, in, the, in the makings. And, you know, even today, we're still talking about the team, with the team, we come up with some new ideas and new prospects and concepts that we think we can put into the hotel from a food and beverage point of view, where we want to develop the, the offerings a bit further. Uh, so we got, we've got quite a lot going on. If you meet our director of engineering, he's definitely going to, uh, where, we talk, where we say the word project, he's, he's having a, a bit of a nervous breakdown. <laughs> Doesn't want to hear that word anymore, project. So we've got a lot of things going on. Well, listen, I think as an expat, everyone's looking for a new Sunday roast, so hopefully yeah. that's on the menu. For yeah, absolutely, yeah, it certainly is. Uh, and yourself, David, personally, you know, what does, what does the future of hospitality look like for for you? For me, I'm very happy where I am. My passion is, you know, I went away for a couple of years. I was doing something else. I was working more for an owning company, developing and opening hotels here in Dubai. And, um, you know, it was okay, but it wasn't my passion. My passion is when I got the opportunity to come back here to this hotel, it's very clear. My passion is running hotels, is being here with the team every day, um, I love this hotel, I love this business, and this is the reason I was in it from the beginning, and um, nothing could be better for me than doing this. I have no desire to do anything except run a great hotel. Yeah, I can feel it from you. So, <laughs> David, honestly, this has been an absolute pleasure, so thank you so much. Good, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>